four, three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Expanding Mind. I'm your host, Eric Davis, continuing our conversations about the cultures of consciousness. Uh, I've been encouraging folks to uh, reach out and uh, not just touch someone, but touch me. Not directly, but just metaphorically in terms of getting in contact with me, letting me know how you're feeling about the show as I'm kind of plotting and planning uh, changes I'll be rolling out later this year. Of course, I always urge people to uh, uh, leave a review, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does seem to uh, make a, a, a difference and it also makes me happy. I mean, even if you say negative things, it's kind of good because if you bother to write at all, I mean, I'm probably not pissing you off that much because I'm wishy-washy enough that it's really hard for people to like you know, tie me down to one p- perspective that then they can, you know, uh, attack me on. Although that, that, it does happen on occasion. But mostly uh, the information I get or the feedback I get is pretty positive. Uh, I want to remind you, too, that uh, PRN has started up a, a, a voicemail line where they invite folks to come and leave uh, audio messages about their shows. That, that, uh, that line is 862-800-6805-862. 800 6805 and it's experiment like all this stuff um got a couple of uh good emails this uh this week one uh, encouraging me to uh, dive into uh twin peaks which uh we'll do one of these days i'm looking for just the awesomest guests because i am not a master of the arcana by any stretch of the imagination and i'm interested in talking to some folks um, particularly not another nerdy white guy. But, you know, sometimes it's just a nerdy white guy scene, like today is going to be a nerdy white guy scene. You know, we do we do our best. Um, another person really, uh, this is, happens a lot, people encourage me to do a, a, a longer format, you know, more of a Joe Rogan, multiple hours kind of scene. And at the same time, I talk to other people and they love that it's only an hour. They just love, they know it's going to be done, they know how long it's going to be. So I might try to work out some... Uh, a weird con- uh, combination of those two modes, you know, stay tuned on that one. And uh, uh, the sweetest thing anybody said uh, is uh, from a musician, Sean Feeney, um, who talked about uh, how I've always appreciated how expanding mind never tells people what to think, but rather the conversations on your show provide a model of how to think and how to engage deeply with others. Well, that was really sweet. And I think it's a wonderful way to launch into our conversation today because I'm talking to my old friend, uh, Douglas Rushkoff, uh, author of the new book, Team Human, and of course, author of gazillions of other books, uh, many of which are very important. And they're still really relevant, even the ones he wrote 20 years ago. Uh, But particularly some of the recent ones, uh, Present Shock was a a rock and roller. Uh, Team Human is, is... uh, the most manifesto-like of any of them, so it's got a different kind of energy uh, responding to the urgency of our moment, as did Present Shock, but this one is a real different, uh, it's really trying to do something different in, in the reader, but of course, Doug's also a documentarian, he's written comic books, uh, you know, he, uh, he's also really close to me because when I first was starting to do research that eventually became Technosis, I heard about this, this guy, this other New York writer, uh, was doing this book on, on, on similar topics. And then he came out with Siberia and, you know, really jumped way ahead of me in terms of diving into the uh, deep end of the Kool-Aid uh, in, a, in a fun and, uh, and stimulating way that I can still see traces of. I'm, he, Doug is very much in my kind of generation and mind frame in a lot of ways in terms of big influences from Timothy Leary, from Marshall McLuhan, from... Uh, you know, Marxist or leftist kind of uh, critiques of capitalism, but at the same time mixed with a, a humanism and, and love of, of art and literature. So I always really like to see uh, where he's going. But that, that idea of, of modeling a conversation is, is uh, I think, really, uh, really key because that's one of the things that, um, that Douglas is talking about in his new uh, book, which is that we're, we're on a team. We're in a team, folks. And if we're in a team and this team is going to f- fight some of the other teams that are uh, mounting uh, most formidable forces against us with all manner of technologies and uh, out of control algorithms, both uh, literally digital and um, metaphorically capital and uh, value systems, etc., cetera, that uh, we need to find the others and know how to talk with the others and talk as others. And so hopefully we'll be doing some of that 
um, today. So, Doug, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, we were just talking before we started recording about how this this book, the the rollout, the talks, the the podcast, the conversations has been different for you. And you've written so many books. So when you say that, it's like, that means something because it's not like, you know, ah, the same old thing. You've been doing this, you've, you've done this many times. So when, if you notice a difference, something different is happening. What is it about uh, this, either this project or this time in history that is making uh, Team Human hit in a, a different angle or with a different velocity? Well, I mean, I guess it's two things. I mean, first off, uh, I don't know. For the first time, I don't feel like this. My book tour has a, a utilitarian purpose. In other words, I'm not doing it for something else. I'm not going out on tour to sell books, to push product. To, I'm not trying to get people to do something. The The events I've been doing so far, they've been so much like for their own sake. It was almost as if, if anything was for anything, it was like I wrote the book in order to get to have these events, you know, <laughs> in order to get to have these, these live encounters. I mean, I'm happy to have done the book, this great industrial age product, you know, that, that can get to places that I can't and reach people and, and spend, it, it can spend all sorts of time with people that I can't spend myself. But the, the events I'm doing, even if they're at a bookstore or somewhere, they're not subservient to that. They're not, uh, uh, you know what I mean? They're not. I'm not there to to get something done. I'm not going to sit there and read from the book and tell people why they should get it. And no, it's like it's some it's for something else more important. And it was very strange. I did one in New York at this place, and I didn't expect it to be even that good. At this place called um, Beta Work Studios. It's a uh, you know like a. a tech development co-working space down in the meatpacking district of Manhattan. And I thought it would be an interesting kind of preview thing to do and see what they think of these ideas. And like 200 and something people uh, jam into this place that was like big enough for 80. And I didn't feel like it wasn't me like, initiating something it wasn't me sparking the 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 revolution or something but it was more like i was present at it you know that my book or this event was the excuse for people to come together and say not quite i'm mad as hell and i'm not going to take it anymore but you know we don't like the way this has been going we don't like the way uh silicon valley has been steering the future of humanity through its technologies and we want to retrieve some you know, much more essential human values and start building a world that's friendly uh, to us humans. And it was weird. It was like being at this revolution and not in some egotistical way that I'm, oh, Rushkoff says, let's gather here and do it. It wasn't really that at all. It was like, I felt uh, so much less like the presenter than just this other person in this room who maybe was doing a little bit more articulation than than others. But yeah, uh, that's really, great. I mean, not. there's so many things you, you you've said there that that have that have uh, that that strike me. I mean, one is is the sense of why you do what you do, and and I've been wrestling with some of these issues doing this podcast because for many many years I really put my kept my head in the sand, like I didn't really pay attention to the podcast world. I didn't really look at numbers. I didn't think about what competitors were doing or even thinking about them as competitors. And I still don't really think about them as competitors. But as soon as you start to quantify and then there's some anxiety about what you're doing and we're in this competitive environment and you're supposed to be making money and then, oh my God, you can use a windfall if you just do it right, blah, blah, blah. And as I noticed as soon as I got kind of caught up with those things that I would drift away from the sort of goal, drift away from the, 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 the kind of endless value of just keeping the conversation rolling without having it drive towards some kind of sell. Um, and, and particularly like the, the line that guy was talking about where, you know, I don't really know, you know, and I, I'm, I'm interested in continue keeping the space open of not knowing and also of being able to strongly not know to say things like, where we're going with technology right now is a, is a is a nightmare. I can see the nightmare on the horizon like so many people. I don't know how to stop it. I don't know what else we need to do, but that doesn't mean 
you know, we can't, we have to make space for this kind of conversation. And what you're saying about the response at that at that no doubt very kind of tech techy heavy environment in New York that you were you were at is it reminds me of this the weird way that like Yuval Harari is like this sort of superstar in Silicon Valley, even though what he says is a very in some ways very bleak and believable account of how this these kinds of post-human technologies are even likely to undermine uh, human agency. And yet there's this kind of exuberance around him, some way that he resonates. He doesn't come off as a, of, as a neo-Luddite. He doesn't come off as a Bill McKibben or somebody who's just a, a, who's perceived as a crank or perceived as someone outside of the fold. And because you, and to some degree me, are, are also associated with this technology world that we drank deeply of uh, 90s tech, digital utopianism and, and and really kind of enjoyed in some ways some of the transhuman impulses that at a certain point were setting in motion uh, shifts in consciousness and, cult- and culture around technology that when we go oh boy or or eek or whatever the mm-hmm. the kind of core emotional response is there might be a lot more room for people who are now profoundly ambivalent but confused or still getting paid that way and not really sure how to re, re- regroup um, to be able to shift and, and, and to be able to really directly engage the urgency of the moment and not you know no, turn away from the, the sort of mythology that keeps getting iterated about disruption and you know, the, the, the force of evolution and how it's evolving into these post-human forms and we just got to go with it and all of these things that you analyze, you know, quite well in Team Human. Um, it, it feels like there is some space for a different kind of conversation and hopefully more than conversation, hopefully more than, uh, th- than action. Um, so what do you, in terms of that more than conversation mode, um, how do you f- see your role? Are you are you kind of like a, a, a John the Baptist and the you know the real force, the real figurehead, or the collective uh, uh, you know shift is kind of ahead or or in a different zone? Or do you see Team Human for you and the events you've been doing as really attempting to to broaden this into a kind of movement? Do you want it to be? Do you want it to be a movement? Yeah, a movement of sorts. I mean, not a movement like, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, marching down Fifth Avenue arm in arm with this one and that one. You know, it's not like let's keep our eyes on the prize and an ends justifies the means journey towards salvation. But a movement where, you know, people feel comfortable engaging with one another. I mean, uh <laughs> It's funny. I mean, movements are so political and you know what I mean? They, they seem to really uh, uh, generate uh, oppositions really quickly, but a movement of sorts. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm going to different places or planting seeds or lighting fires or really just acknowledging people who are already there saying these things, uh, becoming an excuse sometimes for those people to find one another. You know, I'm, I'm ending events now by saying, okay, anybody who has a need and anybody who has an offering, t- what are they? You know, let's match the people who have stuff to offer with the people who need stuff. Um, and what do you all want to talk about? And sort of doing breakup groups and just letting people, you know, find others to, to collaborate with. Because so many people feel really alone in this. They'll walk around in the street and see everybody looking in their smartphones or having certain kinds of jobs and they don't realize that how many, maybe everybody, um, is feeling this way. And it's <laughs> so it really shouldn't be it shouldn't be too hard uh, to mobilize. Yeah, I certainly hope so. I mean what you, you do a really good job. There's a there's a, some really standout analyses in, in the book you know, t- you're talking about things that I'm, you know, fairly familiar with, but then you, you draw it together with a really excellent example or, or a, a, f- a reframing that I hadn't thought of. And one that was really interesting was that you were talking about how um, 
digital telephony, you know, the way that the, that the uh, uh, computers shift the quality of, of a phone call in comparison to the earlier analog zone where there really was a kind of analog presence or a trace of an analog presence in a phone call. And phone calls could be re- really quite intimate. But there's something kind of chilly and disturbing about them now. And I didn't, and I was just sort of unconsciously thought, oh, I'm just kind of, there's so much c- communication now. I'm just kind of sick of the phone. I, I don't want to deal with it anymore. But you explained the way in which even this device that, though technological, was once very much associated with intimacy, you know, cradling the little phone, especially if you're talking to a lover and being able to whisper into it or speak more closely and have that really have an effect. Uh, with digital telephony, you know, it's reduced to this tiniest bandwidth signal and there's all this latency, so we just don't sense that presence. And the same thing happens with our much vaunted video phones. The one Jetsons thing we got uh, was these video phones. But while they're useful in some sense, and it's nice to see old friends from the other side of the planet and to see you know, your lover's eyes or something with when you haven't seen them for a while. It's also very hollow. And it really struck me about even these these points of the digital environment, a phone call, a video call with someone you know well, even these points where there's sort of maximum uh, in, implied intimacy, there's still something very hollow about it. And, and so looking at all those people reading their phones all the time and on the public transportation or out in the out in the city you get this sense of like seeking filling trying to fill this desire for connection and the whole thing is like connection 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 and yet it's really hollow and we don't we don't know what to do it's like it's such an addictive kind of behavior i do it um and how I do mean, we shift the, the, the science backs this up too i mean I, and i spent a lot of time with a guy named uh William Softkey looking at uh, uh, the way that rapport gets established between people. I mean, and we know in, in real life we have, you know, these painstakingly evolved social mechanisms, you know, for 500,000 years we learned how to read someone else's face to see if they're flushing or going pale, if their pupils are getting larger or smaller, if their breathing is sinking to ours or not, if they're making micro movements, you know, and those all help us establish rapport with another person. When, when you see those things happening, the mirror neurons in your brain fire and oxytocin goes through your bloodstream and you can bond and all this stuff happens. And to some extent, it's funny, you know, it happens in real life and folks like, uh, uh, say, Walter Benjamin, probably, in, in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, when he was talking about aura and how the, we have this loss of aura when we look at a photograph or listen to a recording. To us now, industrial age connection, like a photograph or an analog phone call, feels like aura compared to, <laughs> to screens and digital recordings, which which feel like which feel like nothing. So you have a conversation with someone on Skype or FaceTime and they agreed with you and said that they agreed with you, but you get off the phone and part of your body and mind aren't, aren't, uh, they're comparing notes and they have different responses. So your brain is saying, yes, she agreed with me. She definitely agreed with me, but your body is saying, but I didn't get those, those, the feedback that I was expecting from someone who agrees with me. So you end up feeling like the person lied to you. You end up distrusting the person. We don't evolve to distrust a medium. You, you know, we didn't evolve with media. We, inv- we evolved with other people. So we blame the other person. We don't blame the technology through which we were, we were attempting to connect. And the, the weirder part of that is because we're not getting that feedback that we're expecting because it's just a little bit off because the latency is almost connecting, but not. That's what actually addicts you to the technology. If we got what we needed from the technology, we wouldn't be addicted. We'd just be satisfied. Instead, we go back, we go back, we go back because it's not quite feeding the thing that we feel like it's feeding. It's like a cheese doodle instead of real food. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a remarkable thing. And then, of course, at the same time, and it increases that sense also the the sort of ambient distrust of people 
and and of people's motives. Right. And at the same, you know, and that's of course happening at the same time that there is a sort of whatever the the rise of the entrepreneurial self. Everybody has a, a scam. Everybody has a a scheme, a thing that they're trying to pull off. Even bohemians, even artists, everybody's like being taught to not just have a conversation, not just develop a shared. A worldview or to to play even but to always be kind of on the make always be kind of trying to maximize to efficient size to, to right. optimize maximize the relationship. your utility value mm -hmm. what's the purpose of this phone call what are we going to do we've got 10 minutes what are we going to accomplish and it's like what am i going to get from you what are you going to get from me to make it an even transaction i mean that's why governments become transactional too that's the only way we understand stuff and really the analysis to use would be less technological than capitalism. You know, capitalism expressing itself through digital technology yields LinkedIn, not the well. Exactly. No, it's and and that's one of the things I really love about your book and I and that I hope actually moves minds is that you understand technology and media very well. You are critical of how technology and media are deployed. You 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 are sensitive and again sometimes quite acutely to the particular qualities of a given medium or its affordances, to use the fancy word you also use, um, uh, d dictate certain behaviors or responses. But you're also very clear about the problem is, is not technology per se. I mean, some technologies might have some inherent problems, but uh, that the problem really is more about capitalism. Um, and especially the the totalitarian drive of capital. It's not even, you know, like capitalism is not the same thing as the market. And in some ways it just sort of exploits the idea of the market and it takes advantage of real markets to do its other more monopolistic, more controlling kind of, kind of thing. But even if that kind of capitalism just stayed in its sort of zone, it might not be the worst thing in the world because it is incredibly productive. If there was some way to redistribute its it's it's goods better but but in, in addition to the fact that it's not redistributing its goods better and in fact it's just getting worse and worse it's also so invasive so invasive just like you talk about the way that the screen moves from like the you know the movie screen to the tv screen to the screen on your phone to now it's going to be projecting into our eyes or a google phone or it's like the screen is getting closer and closer and closer to our actual surface of vision so too does does capitalism kind of send its logic of, of efficiency, of exploitation, of competition, uh, of, of measuring herself and through a, through a certain kind of greed, of having greed be a kind of unspoken or spoken value, that all of those things just enter into ever minutely uh, the, 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 the little resistant pockets of our experience, our consciousness, our, our most intimate relationships. Um, and it's so it really is kind of a, a, a once you look at it, that capitalism in, in functioning through things, I think it both helps clarify the technology critique, which is really important for a lot of people, especially young people who grow up and they're just swimming in it. Um, but it also, you know, it also forces us to recognize how we ourselves with our values, with the way we treat other people, with the way we think about our own lives and our the, the value the values that we're putting out there how we too are like a, a little mini battleground of these capitalist forces every day well yeah i mean that's why i'm trying to tell a different story and you know, that's where where and you know i'm not totally comfortable with it yet but that's where you know team human the myth or team human the narrative is so important. I'm trying to tell an alternative history of our of our species and society you know and basing it in the real science of Darwin rather than Darwin interpreted through this bizarre left coast libertarian, you know, uh, 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 competitive lens. And that's that, you know, being human is a team sport. The, the extent to which we are an evolved, developed species is really reflected in the extent to which we can collaborate. That's what made us, <laughs> that's, what, that's what evolution is. So we can collaborate with language. We can collaborate with technology. We can use all of these things we've learned to, be, to act more like a coordinated, uh, unified team. You know, and, and, you know, I just, I'm trying to tell that story without becoming like, um, you know, Deschardins or something, without, it, without, without telling a fake story, without 
uh, you know what I mean? Without resorting to mythology, uh, I'm trying to tell it in a realistic way as if this is a better way to understand where we come from and where we can go. This could lead to a more fun, sustainable uh, future for us. And this is how we really, this is how we're actually wired. Yeah. This is, you know, much more fundamental and essential. But, you know, the place that I'm kind of stuck now, and you're a great person to talk to about this, is, um, and it's funny because I've gotten talks with, with a mutual acquaintance of ours, Mark Stallman, a lot about this. And that is, you know, whether we need to, whether we need to accept or, or, believe that there's some pre-existing soul or consciousness or reason, some formal cause for humanity in order to operate this way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, if I'm, it, are, are humans something more than the sum of our parts? You know, I tend to think so, that we're not just you know, entropy makers. We're not just uh, objects. That we are uh, divine in in some in some respect. And it's a, it's kind of a dangerous place to go. Not individually, but it's dangerous if the logic of team human, if the logic of celebrating humanity, if the the logic of defending the right for human beings to have a place in the digital future rather than just algorithms. The only argument I have for it is that human beings are special in some way. And, and that specialness, well, what is the origin of that? And do I need to have one? Yeah, that's a really deep question. I mean, the way that I had formulated it uh, in, in regards to your book was reading through and, and you, you're, you're regularly contrast the human with these post-human technologies or algorithms or uh, manipulative systems. And you never bother to try to explain what the human is. You kind of just let it be there. Let it be in people's minds. Maybe you're, you're almost, it's not even just like a dodge, uh, you know, because at first I was like, what's kind of a dodge? Like, what's the human? What are you trying to defend? And, and I, I have more to say about that in a, in a minute. But then I came to kind of see that there's actually a kind of brilliance in that, which is not very um is is very tentative and very vulnerable which is that you're kind of trusting that your readers your attentive readers or even your less attentive re readers have kind of a general sense already of the difference between the human and some kind of post-human or superhuman state but it might be very different if they might not share underlying axioms. They might not share worldviews. One might be secular and evolutionary. One might right. absolutely rely on some notion of spirit. But everyone's kind of got a sense that like, yeah, I kind of know what it's like to be human. Like, I kind of know what the human side of my experience is. Sometimes I don't feel that human, you know, whatever, in, in deep in meditation, blasted out in psychedelics or or contemplating my own algorithmic nature in the mirror of, 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 of uh, technological capital that has a certain model of who I am that's not human in that sense. And that I kind of go, geez, maybe that's who I really am. And, and I, I want to ask you about that in a second. But uh, to stay with this question, in a way, it is kind of a bind. Certainly, if it's a bind around the, the fundamentally kind of spiritual versus secular model. Like, you know, obviously you can be humanist and totally evolutionary and Darwinian. This is just a process. It's all emerged in natural history. There's no God. There's no essence. There's no particular quality. But it's just these are the values that we have as meat creatures. And it's just better. It's just more fun to keep that going in, in whatever way we can as these other processes are unleashed. And at the same time, you know, in a way, an, a, be, a better axiom is something that is kind of religious, that is that does have some quality of specialness, even if it's not special just to the humans. It's maybe even special to the to the animals, because so many of these things aren't they're not animals. You know, like I feel closer, you know, to dogs or or, or even rats, even bugs sometimes than I feel towards 
technology, although in some ways technology is kind of like a big bug or, you know, ant colony or whatever. Something that's got that kind of mechanistic, you know, like in the kind of insect yeah. quality to it. Um, in fact, in some ways, this is a little sidelight. You know, I, I kind of think that like human beings as a species, at least for, you know, once, once we got, you know, sort of Neolithic civilization, early civilization going, we're kind of this weird hybrid of like, you know, a primate and insect. We're like, we're like ape ants. But in our stories, all our stories and our emotions and our, our, our symbols and our, all that is, is much more on the primate side. But our artifacts and our, our ways of relating with each other, our, our kind of productive systems, our, our mechanisms, our ability to seed large mega machines is much more insectoid. And we're, where we're at right now is like the simian stories are starting to collapse under the pressure of all these much more insectoid systems that we've set in motion, which gives it all a creepy kind of in-your-face multiplicity thing like the end of the, the third matrix movie where they finally fight the the, the 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 baddies and they're just these these kinds of multiplicity machines it's not like one bad boss character it's like this kind of like seething hive of out of control kind of machines and that's more what it what it kind of feels like so what is the story how do you keep the human story going without sounding like a reactionary humanist without pulling a a, a a religious card. It's a tough one. It's really, and that was my biggest question about the book. I was like, especially, and you know, you and I both came of age the same kind of time when we were young, you know, the, a lot of the critical theory and sort of deconstruction and philosophy, contemporary philosophy was very anti-humanist. It was very critical of the idea, the ideas of humanism, because it, it saw the way that those led to forms of oppression and forms of exploitation. But now we have not, like we have nothing else to really as a, we have nothing else as a shield other than this kind of wan humanism that may or may not be infused with some degree of ne of religiosity that's nebulous enough so that we don't start fighting amongst ourselves. You know, no, it's a soul. No, it's a it's mine. No, it's just right. you know human things. So I don't know what else to do other than kind of keep it open and resonant for now. Because right, which is sort of what that's where I'm trying to go with it is to say that, look, the last uh, the last major expression of humanism was during the Renaissance. And that was the humanism of the individual, you know, the Vitruvian man and all of those great Renaissance innovations were, from perspective to the book were all about an individual point of view. And then saying, well, what if our Renaissance is about the collective, a new understanding of humans as a group phenomenon? And if there, whether or not there is a spiritual, religious origin aspect to it, the humans together allow for something seemingly magical to happen, something special, something different, something worthy of a place in the future. Because all I'm really doing is saying, do human beings deserve a place in the future what is the difference between human beings and the zombies in those amc walking dead shows you know is there a difference and the difference is if it's not that we have a soul the difference at least is that we can regard one another you know <laughs> the zombies don't have teamwork they're individuals they're not conscious we can find other people and connect and something else happens when you connect to another person. And, and until we fully understand that, I think we owe it to ourselves not to go extinct. I think that's really beautiful. And for me, I think that a slight difference is that I have trouble when I think about the group, the, the larger it gets, the more it's a group, the more it's a collective, the more it's, then I'm like, okay, Yes, there's power, positive things to come out of this. There's solidarity. There's the kind of sense of the crazy ur urban landscape of New York City or or Black Rock City or Los Angeles. And I love cities. I'm an urban person. I love traveling to cities. So I love the sense of the multiplicity of the hive as a kind of vibe. But I think you're, what you're just pointing out when we're trying to find that specialness about humans is something that's maybe easier to see 
on the level of conversation, on the level of, of you and I. Uh, and I think that's probably why literally you and I are drawn to this form, not just podcasts, but having conversations, having public conversations like the Team Human event that I took place with you. It's not just that like the only thing that matters is two people talking. It's that two people talking, really talking, really listening, empathizing, feeling with your hearts and your bodies if you, if you get to be in the same space, um, is a model not only of, t- of a larger sense of togetherness, but it, it demonstrates that magic spark that you're talking about, which is not reliant on some essence. Human beings have a soul, they have inherent rights, blah, blah, blah. Instead, it's the capacity for sparks to fly and for something new to emerge, like in a jazz combo where we're playing together and we're listening so intently that something new happens that neither of us are responsible for. And for me, this has always been, always also been the, the limit of a certain kind of Eastern or um, Western interpretation of Eastern ideas in terms of like it's all illusion or, you know, we're all just projecting, you know, or there's a neurological version. You know, we all just want to run around with models of the world in our mind and we're not actually engaging with reality. We're just engaging with our internal models as, as the brain runs a kind of simulation game all the time. And I'm like, okay, cool, sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe we're in a simulation. But the place where that breaks down for me is when I'm encountering another, like an other with a capital O. I can't delimit that with like a story of projection. I just don't believe it. Now well, particularly say, another in pain. Very good. Very good. You know, and I, I agree. I mean, the interesting thing is, it's funny, I was on Sam Harris's podcast and he got concerned about the whole team, 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 human thing. Say also talking about, well, you know, when groups get too big or too important, that they can start repressing individual rights and all that. And, you know, he kind of got into a slightly constitutional argument. And, you know, and I said, well, you know, the first right of the individual is the right to assemble, you know, <laughs> that Very how, how good. Can you even experience without, without assembly. But there's a difference between cities, which are kind of uh, uh, almost organic, natural amalgamations of people and nation states, which are these artificial top down, you know, ideologically uh, 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 organized myths of origin, you know? (laughs) So of course, nation states are going to be oppressive or repressive because we don't really belong to nations. Cities, we we practically were in them. You know, that's what they are. They, they are, um, they are much more the 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 healthy natural ant hive termite mound than uh, than some kind of a nation state. You know that that makes a lot of sense. And it, it one of the things also I came away from your book that 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 responds to that is you know we're at a point where so many of our given narratives are being undermined, disrupted, whether by technologies that ask us to change our habits or expectations of what daily life is like whether it's, you know, new models of the self, you know, actually I'm a biome with all this, all these bacteria in my gut and it's a we, you know, or whatever. There's just so many ways in which our even re- relatively recent ideas of what the human is, what society is, how society should work are being questioned. And yet there are some of these Ideas like the nation state, which is so obviously a construct, anybody with a, like a, a thimble full of history, it's a, it is like the example of what a construct is in that sociological sense of like, oh, everything is a construct, which I don't believe. But the nation state is definitely a construct. And yet, what are we seeing? We're seeing this like crazy nationalism as if the very artifice of that concept somehow enables people to orient themselves at this time and it's 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 kind of a you know a striking contradiction and so what what i really liked about your book is uh, in a subtle way right not just saying question reality question your ideas it's like yeah we've been doing that for a long time but that there still are some core notions like you need a job the jobs are important jobs right. provide value well oh my god I, I i still kind of believe that and i'm like why do i believe that and i'm like that's dumb especially when all these other things are asking me to change my fundamental values, including values that are much more obviously positive than that one. So it, it does seem like we're at a point where like, this is the, the only way through is forward, where like, 
yeah, we think we're like calling into question all these like structuring myths and ideas, but we still have a lot more to do. Yeah, we do. And especially, I mean, the reason why now is an important time to do that is we are currently embedding these values into the algorithms that are going to be dictating uh, uh, human life in the future. We're embedding them just like, you know, the, the Jews embedded values into Talmud, which became the laws by which human beings live. Now we're embedding values into the code by which people will live. Only the code is not transparent. Only a few people are going to be able to read it. Even fewer than lawyers can read code today or can read the law today. So it's, it's kind of an, an, an essential responsibility that we retrieve these values before um, the, the value system is locked down. Yeah, I, 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 you have a, a wonderful... I mean, one of the things also, again, to, to, to praise the book is just there are many, many very pithy points where you're able to boil down these complex conditions into single sentences that hit almost like, you know, kind of spooky apocalyptic poems about what, especially when you're accounting for things like the problem is not that the robots are going to take over. The problem is that as we hand over our lives to robots, the, we're going to take on these values and then be, you know, it's, it's like a feedback loop and you, right. you're really good at describing that kind of uh, that, describing that kind of feedback loop. But there's something about that, maybe it's a slightly different question that I really wanted to ask you. And I, I'm actually going to read a little chunk because it kind of sets up, uh, it sets up the question. It's sort of earlier on, you're talking about uh, persuasive technologies. You say, that's why persuasive technologies are not designed to influence us through logic or even emotional appeals. This isn't advertising or sales. You're talking about the new regime of persuasive technologies. It's not advertising or sales in the traditional sense, but more like wartime psyops or the sort of psychological manipulation exercised in prisons, casinos, and shopping malls. Just as the architects of those environments use particular colors, soundtracks, or lighting cycles to stimulate desired behavior, the designers of web platforms and phone apps and other technologies we can imagine use carefully tested animations and sounds to provoke optimal emotional responses from users. So you're talking about that level of control and manipulation. So my question for you is like, we're kind of both. Like in some sense, we are still agents that are thinking, choosing, nudging our own behavior to some degree. We can argue about it. We're, we're still engaging. You and I are using language to connect. We have a sense of being in each other's space right now that's going to be gone in 20 minutes. And at the same time, there is that unconscious level of ourselves, our bio-behavioral uh, stimulus response machine that is constantly being manipulated, especially now, in ever more sophisticated ways, and in a way that I can't get to directly. I mean, I can look at it as a sociologist, I can study it in the lab, but I can't access it directly as it's happening. Um, how do we negotiate kind of being in both worlds and recognizing that these anti-human forces that we're hopefully you know, gathering together to resist or oppose, how do we, I don't know, navigate a, a, a domain, a, a territory where we can't even see the enemy because it's operating on us beneath our, our awareness? Right. Or it's also easy to, to mistake the tool for the enemy. You know, just because capitalism is expressing itself through the web doesn't mean the web is itself capitalist, you know, or, or it's necessarily disempowering. You know, which is why all of these, uh, 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 you know, supposed ironies that, oh, look at those protesters, uh, Occupy kids, but they're protesting against Wall Street, but they're holding on to iPhones as if that disproves <laughs> the merits of what they're talking about. Um, it's, it's, it's really tricky. I mean, one thing I've been telling people is to understand every technology they use as a drug. You know, every single one. And, and you know, and you remember what Timothy Leary used to say about drugs. Before you, before you take a drug, look into the eyes of somebody who's on the drug and decide if that's someplace you want to be. Um, 
if you think about every technology that you're that you turn on before you go on a, open your laptop before you open your email program before you look at your at your smartphone um before you install any app if you think about do i want to install this drug into my life what am i like when i'm on this and you know when i think about think about it that way it goes all the way back you know when you pick up a book do i want to be on print now you know when you decide to speak do i want to be on english now and once you start thinking about it that way and i don't mean it in the in the oh my god we'll never get there but once you think about it it's like that's why monks would go on on you know uh, uh speech fasts you know they'd go on on silent retreats because Oh my gosh, you know, yes, language is a great thing and it helped connect people to one another and did all this stuff and helped us collaborate. But different languages also have different affordances. Once you have a noun for everything, you're limiting each thing in some definition. I remember somebody's kid saying to him, God, once we have a name for something, we kind of kill it, don't we? I mean, yeah. I mean, you've limited it now. That is cat. And all those assumptions come in about what cat is. Um, you know, the, 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 the languages of signifiers change our relationship to reality. So it seems to me it's, it's, it's more about being able to at least have extended periods of time when you're not online or on a medium or on a technology just to kind of um, reset as best you can. I mean, meditation, I mean, is really hard for a lot of people, but I would, I, I'm, what I'm starting to do is ask people when they say, what can we do? How do we start? What can we do? And I'm saying, gosh, fine. If you can take 10 minutes a week to start where you're during that 10 minutes, you're not doing anything other than sitting with another person, you know, sit with someone for 10 minutes, you know, you could talk if you have to, but if you could just sit, that's even better. If you got to play cards, that's okay. But sort of mindfully have 10 minutes with a person where you're not subjected to the agendas of all these things, then, you know, it's obvious for us. Now you turn on the TV, you can see it trying to sell you things. You know, you turn on the computer, you can see it trying to, you know, extract your data or um, isolate you or, or atomize you from other people. It becomes so much easier to feel the effects of different media and technologies if you can kind of uh, uh, have a reset button and that reset button, I hate to be so mechanomorphic about it, but you know, if you can you know, hit ground by just calibrating to another human, um, it becomes a lot easier to see. And the stuff feels less overwhelming then, you know, it, it we're lucky because we were around uh, on the, in the era of the internet where you would go online. And that was a discreet act. I'm now going to go online. Where kids now and people now, they don't go online. You're just, it's a constant state of being. But if you can return to that by having moments of non-connected, non-mediated, um, non-commercial, you're not producing or consuming, you're not buying or selling, um, you, you, it's, very, it's a very Mr. Rogers moment for me where I realize, oh, I'm okay just the way I am. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it, it's so profound to get to touch that on a regular basis. No, that's great. And that also has something to do with, with humanism. One of the th uh, lines that stuck with me in your book, it was just kind of a, a small bit where you were saying how a lot of the, the classic humanists sort of celebrated our, our foibles. You know, we came out of this religious model where we were supposed to be pure, or if we weren't pure, we were just horrible sinners. And so in order to, to shift outside of that model of judgment, we had to kind of embrace our, our, our flaws and sort of recognize them. And that gives rise to the novel and ca flawed characters that we nonetheless love and, and see ourselves in relationship to. And it, it feels to me that like, one of the answers to what is the human is that sense of being aware of your own flaws, aware of the your your friend or lovers or or wife or child's flaws, and sort of being with them and even feeling the the unpleasantness there. But at the same time, having that be in a space that you can sort of accept and work with, or even accept the way that you're you're always going to be irritated by it, or whatever that is. It's something about those flaws, those ordinary flaws, not the great heroic flaws, but just the ordinary flaws that feels like we're close 
um, to that human uh, moment. So I love that idea of just sitting with people. But you, I'm also glad you mentioned meditation. You have some very interesting words to say about spirituality in the book and the ways in which certain aspects of, let's say, the countercultural spiritual explosion that you know you and I, in our own ways, both fed off of or learned some things from, um, how aspects of that really helped, in a way, drive this kind of, you know, after a few transformations, drive this this sort of transhumanist model of, of a kind of sense of like what that you know there's something in us that's not human there's something in us that's of the beyond of the, or or of the future which in a way is the same kind of idea that the tra- this transcendental part of us can be incarnated in new technologies or techniques that are going to make us more efficient optimize blah 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 and all that language of optimize efficient size uh, balance uh, integrate holism even like even though there's different ways of interpreting it oftentimes when you hear that language particularly particularly today, it's kind of a code for this anti-human agenda. And so even spirituality, even the idea of like meditate gives you, give yourself a break from the, from the machine, even that is kind of a vexed territory. It's already, uh, has, has, has dip, there's already a contest on with multiple agendas, one of which is to like just get your psychology in line so you can be smoothly reproducing the forces of capital. And one of the hopes is that it just doesn't work, that the, uh, the corporatization of meditation and mindfulness, the, the, the way in which it becomes part of uh, consumer culture through like yoga sexiness and all that kind of narcissism of, of, uh, of the health movement, um, that all of that is sort of a necessary bargain to create individuals who are too discontent with the way things are to just accept them blithely or accept them as just the way things are, man, you got to go with the flow, instead discovering a kind of oppositional energy that that taking a media fast isn't just good for your psychic health, which it is, but it's also a way to regain autonomy. It's a way to regain clarity. It's a regain to strengthen yourself for what in some ways is a kind of ongoing assault on the human. Uh, that the, that we're we're in a more conflictual territory, and we need these tools more like warriors than like soft, gushy, go with the flow, you know, kind of corporate holistic people. If you know what I mean. I mean, I'm kind of overgeneralizing, but I think uh, that you really kind of nailed some of the problems with the way in which this spirituality is used to perpetuate some of the problems you describe. Yeah, well, and a lot of that comes, you know, from your work and, you know, technosis and this, you know, quest out of body, this, you know, so many people get involved in spirituality because they don't like who they are and how they are and, and the way things are, you know, and they think that they're going to be able to travel out of body or somehow escape the chrysalis of matter and rise into pure consciousness and leave all this horrible stuff behind. And there's really, there's a self-loathing in there that just dovetails so well with Ray Kurzweil's singularity and uploading consciousness and escaping from the, the heathens and the masses and all the people that you've done wrong to and, <laughs> you know, somehow break my karmic cycle by escaping it that way. Um, and it's, it's it, I understand the drive. I can empathize with the drive, but but that's not that's not going to work you know? <laughs> what, what about and, what, what do you do what, what works for you how do you how do you encourage the space in your in your busy life your family man you teach you write tons of stuff you know you're you're a busy guy you know it's funny i i i encourage it by kind of by giving up um I spent a lot of time thinking, well, okay, I'm going to go on my book tour and just hunker down. And then when I'm through with it, I'm going to, then I'll have time to experience the world the way I really want to. Then I'll, I'll, you know, stop writing books and, you know, do like David Lynch says and, and, you know, just, you know, try to catch the big fish and all that. Um, And, Something, I don't know, it was pretty recently, something flipped where I was like, no, you know, I'm just going to do it 
moment to moment to moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do, um, I do a lot of yoga as a kind of a moving meditation and I'm starting now just doing, I sit when I can. I mean, it's hard for me because, you know, I'll get 500 to a thousand emails in a day. And if I spend 15 minutes sitting and meditating, that's six people who didn't get answered. Um, so the the scale at which digital industrialism exposes me to uh, uh, sort of the pitfalls of a, of a customer service existence, um, uh, I had to weigh that against what value am I am I even creating if I'm driving myself into the ground if I'm just going to die soon um, trying to service everybody. So I kind of flipped on that. And um, it's not like I that I have boundaries so much as I'm accepting that, look, dude, I get you want a mentor and someone to help you pick a school or do this or help you with your book or read the thing you're doing. I just can't. Um, God bless. You know, there's a great school here you can go to, or maybe go to this list or go online here. Um, because there's there, I don't know because I can't. And so, and, and that was part of the way we started this whole conversation was that, wow, this book tour is kind of turning out different. I don't have an agenda. I'm not trying to do something. And that's really the practice for me to not do anything for reasons other than its own sake, which is a really strange practice. But I remember in, in Talmud, they um, had some argument about Talmud and they're like, well, what's the real reason to be, it, 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 to be studying Torah? Is it to develop one's ethics or is it to know the stories of our history? And the rabbis said, neither. Um, the, the reason to read Torah is lishma, meaning for its own sake, <laughs> you read Torah to read Torah. And um, it's a really nice lesson for, especially for someone like me who feels like I need to justify every, you know, cubic centimeter of air I breathe or every, you know, kilowatt of electricity I use and, and food I eat. You know, it's like, you know, there's a certain point at which you can't justify it. You're never going to be able, the, the ledger will never work out. You know, so I, I had to just kind of, drop that and decide that that these the the doing is the thing but if the doing is the thing then you got to start looking at how you're doing what you're doing yeah because that's the only thing you really got is what you're actually doing right now yeah um is the only thing you truly 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 know for sure well that's a great place uh to to end that's uh wonderful and if if the team human does nothing except invite you into this transformation it's already a, a classic in my view but of course it's more <laughs> than that uh and so I, I encourage people to read it i think it's really important what you're doing always lovely to talk to you and uh, thanks for joining us on expanding mind thank you thanks for expanding my mind uh, righty oh okay folks till next week keep your minds open <laughs>